three minutes. Car four. Car one. Car one. Car one? Right in there. Right in there, buddy. Car one. Car three. Car one. Thank you. Uh, pardon me. You're back. Thank you so much. Yeah. Car three. Car two. Car one. Car four. Car one? I'll carry your bag, sir. Never mind, I'll carry it. Okay, boss. Didn't I tell you I wanted a compartment in the middle of the train? Yes, Mr. Gellard, but the reservation clerk at the hotel said this was the only accommodation left. I told him who you were, and he did everything possible to try and meet your wishes. Oh, well, it doesn't matter, only I don't like riding so close to the engine. I hope you have a pleasant trip, Mr. Gellard. Oh, uh, don't forget to lock the door, sir. You can't tell on these trains. That's all right, Black. I've carried diamonds before. Tell Mr. Wartzel I'll wire him from Montreal. Very good, sir. That's the work, Sable. Just a minute. Come in. Thank you. Face that wall. Keep your hands up and your mouth shut. Get back there. No, no, don't!
trap shut. What do you got in that bag? Nothing. Nothing you'd want. Just papers. Oh, yeah? Well, suppose we take a look. Come on, open it up. All right, get it open. Well, they're no good to you. Yeah? Maybe they ain't. But I'm going to take them with me just to teach you to mind your own business. Oh, please don't. Please. Now, don't stick your head out this door. Or make any noise. You might get hurt. Must have got off that way. What's all the excitement? What happened? I was robbed. He came out of the compartment next to mine. Did he have a gun? Yes, he did. I was afraid to scream. Looks like he made his getaway, all right. My, my. Oh, oh help me on time. I was robbed. Robbed of $75,000 worth of diamonds. I tell you, he mustn't get away. He robbed me, too. What did he look like? I don't know. He snapped the lights out. He's a phantom. He don't need no light. All right, folks, back in the car. What well, did you see? Which way did he go? Say, Tom. Yeah. You know, I thought I saw the taillight of a car going down that road. But he disappeared so quickly, I couldn't be certain. Well, if you're right, that's where he went. But how he could time the robbery to stop the train just at this point is beyond me. May I ask what this excitement and hubbub is all about? I was awakened out of a sound sleep. Well, my good man, it's all over now. If you'll just step inside, we'll get on our way. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. While we have no legal responsibility in regard to your loss, Miss Marshall, we feel morally bound to put the entire resources of the road at your disposal. Our particular function of police and detective work is sheer goodwill upon the part of the railroad towards its passengers. Well, if that's the case, Mr. Harrigan, why don't you do something about it? I've been to the district attorney's office, and I'm convinced that they don't know any more of the whereabouts of the robbers than I do. Well, we have 150 passengers on the train to check, the background and habits of the crew. Mr. Harrigan. Those papers I was robbed of are the only existing proof that my mother and I have at my uncle's estate. Why, they represent all we have in the world. Well, perhaps when the thief discovers that they are of no value to him, he may return them to you. Well, he's had ten days to do it. Oh, I'm certain that the only way we'll ever get them back is to find him. Well, this is a most unusual case. The area in which the robbery occurred is very sparsely settled. Before a police cordon could be established, the robbers could have been 150 miles away in any direction. That's just it. And nobody's doing anything about it. Here's a complete data on the Green damage claim, which is now closed. Tell Captain Harrigan if there's anything further, he can check with Green's lawyer. All right. This is a list of the crew on the Midnight Limited the night of the robbery. And uh, the young lady is here that Captain Harrigan sent over. Show her in. Come in, please. Mr. Lennon. Oh, yes. How do you do it? Miss Marshall, isn't it? Yes, I understand you're in charge of the investigation of the robbery of the Midnight Limited. That's right. Won't you be seated? Thank you. Of course, you understand, Miss Marshall. There's very little we can say at this stage of the investigation. I hope you're not going to start that. That's all I've heard from everyone I've spoken to since I was robbed. Well, I'd like to put your mind at rest about that. Unfortunately, the people you spoke to had nothing they could tell you. I don't want to make this sound too melodramatic, but it's essential that the utmost secrecy be observed in the development of this case. Now, a thoughtless remark giving away anything that we have learned could easily get in the papers. And thieves read papers. But the people who have been robbed. Surely we're entitled to some information as to what the railway authorities are doing to recover our property. I think if you should check the record of the police department of this railroad, you'd feel a decided increase in confidence at leaving the thing in our hands. Now you're asking me to go home and wait with folded hands until you find the papers. 
Papers that mean everything to Mother and me. I realize it's a difficult thing to do, and I'd like to take you into our confidence. But for your own sake, I don't dare. Well, you may have a very efficient police department, but up to date, I haven't seen any evidence that it is. I know that if I had something to do with it, I'd get results. Why can't I help? I'm afraid, Miss Marshall, that would be a little difficult to arrange. But I know I could be of some assistance to you. After all, I'm the only one that actually saw the robber. Nobody reported that. I was told no one saw him. Well, I didn't see his features very clearly, as the corridor was dimly lit. This is very important information. I must talk to Captain Harrigan about this at once. Let's see. Uh, he would be at lunch now. Uh, could I, uh, I mean, would you, uh, I mean, could I take you to, uh... To lunch? Yes. All right. But I'll probably be very boring. I'm not going to talk about anything but the case. Well, I can honestly promise that I'll do the same. Now that I know how much your happiness depends on the recovery of those papers, it makes me more anxious than ever to crack this case. Well, I'm sure I could be of some use to you. Well, I'd do anything I could to help if you'll only let me. Of course, it's against our policy, but there's no doubt about it. It would be of tremendous value to have someone working with us who has an idea of what the crook looks like. How's the spaghettis? You like it, Mr. Len? Fine, Giuseppe, fine. Meno male, meno male. How about the little fruit now? Oh, just black coffee, please. Two black coffees. Lasci fare a me, va bene. I make two coffees right away. I hope I can convince Harrigan. Aside from the value of your having seen this man, it would be awfully nice working with you. Well, then you really think it's possible? We'll get right over to Harrigan's office just as soon as we finish and find out. And so, while the robber was busy with the diamond merchant, Miss Marshall heard a noise. She became frightened and looked out of her compartment door in time to see the thief coming out of Mr. Gellert's apartment. And you occupied the compartment next to the one that was robbed. Yes, that's right. Of course, the light in the corridor was very dim and the brim of his hat partially hit his face. But she got a good impression of him before he reached in and snapped out the light. Are you uh, quite sure about being able to recognize him? Yes, I am. He walked two or three steps, and I got a fair glance at his face as he came toward me. I was so frightened at the time that everything seemed hazy. But I've thought so much about it since that his features have become fixed in my mind. Of course, Miss Marshall can't naturally give a very clear picture. Uh, would you say that he was dark or light? Dark, medium height. Thin and sharp featured. Oh, Captain. Miss Marshall wants to work on this case with us. What? In view of the importance of having someone on call who has actually seen the robber, I think it advisable that we make an exception in our rules and accept Miss Marshall as a temporary member of the force. Well, if in your opinion her knowledge is vital to the case, then I guess there's nothing more to be said. Thank you. Welcome to our company. Yes? All right. They've got the train crew in for you to check on their original statements. Oh, fine. Here's the list. Uh, who do you want in first? Well, let's start with Thomas. Send Thomas in. Oh, hello, Tom. <laughs> Mr. Lennon wants to ask you a few questions. Oh, Tom. Now, listen, Val. Now, don't get huffy, Tom. We've got some things we want to clear up. But well, just a minute. I've been with this road for 20 years. No one can point the finger at me. Now, now, relax. No one's accusing you of anything. We just want you to help us. But I've already told Captain Harrigan everything I know. Yes, I know, but look. Now, for instance, do you remember where Walsh was standing beside the train when he thought he saw the automobile taillight? No, the fool didn't say anything about it until he got back on the train. And you can't think of any other thing that happened out of the usual routine just before the robbery? Oh, I've gone over it a dozen times in my mind, and everything I can recall, you've got. Okay, Tom. Thanks a lot. Send Crams in. Crams, I see by this card that you worked for the Denver and Western for five years. And you worked for us during the last three years. That's right. Well, between the time you left the Denver and Western and came to work for us, there's a four-month period we have no account of. What did you do during that time? Hunted for a job. Well, why did you leave the Denver and Western after five years? Well, my wife wanted to be nearer folks. They live in Connecticut. So during that time, you were looking for a job in New York? Yes, I was. Did you apply to any other road before you came to work for this one? <laughs> no, my wife wanted me to quit railroading, but it seems that that was all I knew. Okay, Grands, that's all. Thank you. How about Walsh? Send Walsh in.
Walsh, you've worked on this railroad for 10 years. Look, Mr. Lennon, you're wasting your time. My movements are all down in that report. Yes, I see. It's very complete. But I've got a job to do. Now, just what part of the train were you on when the robbery took place? I was two cars away, and I can prove it. I didn't see anybody for over an hour before it happened. After it happened, no one passed me. Why should they? The train had stopped, the thief opened the door and jumped off. It's simple. Yes, that's true. It's very simple. But that's what's wrong with it. It's too simple. Now, did you see anyone running away from the train? No, I didn't. But I thought I saw the taillight of a car down that road. That's all anybody does in this case is think. Nobody has any evidence they can swear to. Why do you have to think all the time? Well, I'm not going to say something that I'm not sure of. I thought I did see a car, but it was gone almost immediately, so that I couldn't swear to it. There you are, Val. Another one who thinks. I'm afraid that's what we're going to have to do a lot of, Captain. That's all, Walsh. Let's talk to Willie the porter. Send Willie in. Willie, I want you to take your mind back to the night of the robbery. Boss, I've been trying to keep my mind from going back to the robbery. I like a quiet life. Well, what do you remember about it? What does your mind keep going back to? Nothing, sir. My mind just keeps going back to a blank. We've got to have more than a blank, Willie. Now think. Do you remember seeing anyone roaming around the coach? I don't know, boss. Sometimes I think I saw a great big tough-looking stranger roaming around. And sometimes I think it was just my mind roaming around. You're being a great help, Willie. Yes, sir, boss. I'm willing to help every way I can, but I can't get no cooperation from my memory. Well, well, what do you think? We're exactly where we started. Well, a man just can't vanish into thin air. Is that all, Mr. Lennon, please, sir? Yeah, that's all, Willie. Thank you, sir. Checking in. Who? Jake Pringle. Jake Pringle? Yeah, you heard about all the money won last night, didn't you? No. You did? Yeah. Sixty thousand dollars. Sixty thousand? How long is he staying? Oh, he's gonna leave again tomorrow night, and he's coming over to see you about a reservation in just a minute. Yeah, where's he going? The races? Yeah. And boy, if he hits those bookies the way he took that mob uptown last night, you'll be able to hear him yell all the way down here. I wonder if it's on the level all those big-time gamblers uh, carry their money with them. Sure it is. I've known plenty of them right here in this hotel. They all do it. Well, how do you do, Mr. Pringle? Hiya. Say, I want you to get me a compartment on the Midnight Limited for Montreal tomorrow night. Yes, sir. Uh, this is uh, Rich Plaza. Yeah, I want to reserve one compartment on the Midnight Limited for Montreal tomorrow night. They tell me you gave the boys quite a shellacking night before last. Yeah, whenever those pikers lose a little money, they squawk to everybody in town. Yeah, you said it. Is that the only one you have? Are you sure? All right, thank you. Well, there you are, sir. I hope you have a pleasant trip. Say, uh, where is this compartment? Well, that's well up forward. That's next to the baggage car. I don't want it next to the baggage car. I want it near the middle of the train. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Pringle, but we're lucky to get that. That's the last one on the train. Okay. Come on, Sam. Joe, Ritz Plaza. Jake Pringle, the gambler, is leaving tomorrow night. Yeah. Sixty grand. Yeah, I get it. Car one, compartment E. Yeah. Are you sure he'll have the money on him? Okay, I'll handle it. Detectives have such long hours. 
You ought to have a union or something. Of course, every case has its disadvantages. But in this case, the advantages overshadow the disadvantages. Sometimes you get some awfully nice fellow workers. You ought to keep your mind on your work, not your fellow workers. Yeah, if I don't get a break in this case soon, I won't have any mind left. Look. Where? That little man over there with the derby in the bag. I swear he was on the train the night it was robbed. He seemed to be awfully drunk that night. And, well, he looks the same way now. Come on. Did you please? Yes, yes, indeed. Well, that is right in your hand. Oh, so it is. Car one. <laughs> Stupid of me, wasn't it? <laughs> Say, Brady, follow that drunk right there. See what reservation he has, and I'll check with you later. Yes, sir. He looked kind of shabby to me. Are you sure that's the one you saw on the train? I'm absolutely positive. After the robbery, when they questioned everybody, well, he acted very peculiar. Well, it seems a little far-fetched to me, but let's follow your hunch. Hunch? Why, I'll, I'll... I'll get reservations, and I'll meet you at the gate. All right. I saw Lennon out near the gate tonight. He's certainly taking no chances on another robbery. I think it'd be better if he spent his time trying to crack that first case. Oh, I don't know. Just take a look at that boy's record. He's cracked some mighty big cases for this road. Yeah, I think they're dumb hanging around the station. What they should be doing is combing the small towns up north near where we stop. Those big-time crooks always hangs out in a small town till the excitement dies down. Here he comes. Hello, Mr. Lennon, riding with us? Yeah, Tom. We believe we saw someone connected with that robbery getting on board the train. You did? Yes, that little old man that was tipsy, remember? Yes, I remember. Stick by close, will you, Tom? All right, Val. Compartment D went right in and shut the door. Did he see you? Didn't look around. Well, that's fine. Now, you understand your instructions. You're to watch the front end of the compartment car, and I'll stay here. Now, if he comes out, don't do anything. If he asks you questions, just tell him you're there to guard the baggage car. Now, if he reaches for the emergency card, put him under arrest at once. Yes, sir. You'll have your men on the other coaches, huh, Tom? That's right, Mr. Lennon. Okay, boys. What time is it? It's 1.15. I suppose if he's going to try anything, it'll be another half hour at least. Yes, it was around 1.30 or later the last time. Look, Joan, why don't you get some sleep? I know you're anxious to help, but if he starts anything, you might get hurt. I'm able to take care of myself. After all, I'm a grown woman. Yes, I was fully conscious of that the minute I met you. Pardon, my dear young people, but uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I never dreamed that anyone would be up at this late hour. Oh, it's quite all right. We were just saying good night. Uh, but aren't you up a little late? Insomnia, my dear boy. The curse of those that have weighty problems on their minds. But I'll not interrupt you. I remember the old saying that two is, uh, well, I'll go back to my compartment and immerse myself in the classics. Oh, pardon me. Yes. Do you have a match? I'm sorry, sir, but not being addicted to the use of tobacco, I carry no matches on my person. Smoking is apt to get such a hold on one, don't you think? I beg your pardon, sir. It's too bad that you're not able to sleep. Do you uh, travel much on this train? I despise trains, and I never enter one unless I am forced to do so. Good night. Good night.
Anything new, Val? He came out about five minutes ago. The little guy's on the prowl, all right. Well, what about Bill here standing by for... No, I can handle it all right, Tom. Brady's up at the other end. And if they start anything on this car, we've got him. Okay, Val. Uh, Miss Marshall, don't you think you'd better come back to the Pullman and have a little rest? Oh, no. I want to stay here. I think it's terribly exciting. Something's gone wrong. They got poor Brady. That door's open again. Will he go back to compartment D and see if it's occupied? Yes, sir. Now you must be brave. These things happen. Now go back inside and lie down. Well, I don't want to leave you, Val. I'm frightened. Mr. 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 Lennon, Mr. Lennon has been a big robber. That gambling man, Mr. Pringle, has just been extracted from his bankroll. He's fit to be tied. He's in there, boss. About time somebody came. If he hadn't pulled a gun on me, I'd have broken did, did you see what he looked like? How could I? The door open, he sticks in his hand, throws a flashlight in my face, and robs me of 60,000 cash. 60... That's the way he robbed me, too. Yeah? Yes, I'm working on Miss Marshall's case now. A detective, huh? That's right. Did anyone know you were carrying that much money on you? Nobody except half the population of New York. The whole town who had made a killing. And everyone knows that I always carry a big role. Well, did you specifically mention the money to anyone? I just told you, everyone in New York. Mm. Well, who knew you were making this trip? Listen here, I'm well known. Say, the guy that sold me this ticket, he seemed pretty nosy. What guy? The clerk at the Hotel Ritz Plaza. He made some crack about that poker game I was in. Well, we'll go into that later. Right now, we'll have to search the train. Go on over the train. Yeah, you'll probably be sitting up reading a book waiting for you. Why, there's no sign of him anywhere, Mr. Lennon. I tell you, the whole thing is downright crazy. He didn't pass the engineer in the front, and the brakeman on the rear of the train jumped off immediately and didn't see a thing. Why, there's nothing but brush out there for miles. I see. Well, in the other robbery, the train was stopped at a crossroad, and it was fairly well established that a car was waiting. Now, where's the road, and where's the car? Well, then he might still be on the train. Oh, that's possible. I thought of that. We'd better get underway. Send a message to the police at the next station. Tell them what happened and say I want this locality searched thoroughly. I'll take care of it right away. Oh, Willie. Yes, sir. What about that fellow in compartment D? Oh, uh, yes, sir, boss. Uh, wh what about him? Oh. Never mind, Willie. Never mind. Hey, wake up. Hey, wake up, will you? Well, he's sound asleep. Elementary, my dear Watson. Well, let's find out something about him. You search the bag. something I'm going to find out or give up my job. Come on, let's search the train. John, where were you when the train stopped? Boss, I was up in the washroom, shining shoes, mind my own business. Well, did anyone pass you while you were working? No, sir. Are you sure? Yes, sir. That is, except you and Mr. Wash going up to the head of the car. I don't see how anyone could have passed through here, because I was at the other end of the coach. I think we'd better run down to the baggage car and see what we can learn there. I think so. Thank you. 
Open up, open up. No one's allowed in here. Open up, Crams. This is Leonard. Why didn't you join the others outside when the train stopped? Well, you know the company rules. I have instructions never to leave this car. I'm responsible for all this property. I'm not allowed to take my eyes off it from the time the run begins until I hand it over in Montreal. That's right. Did anyone try and get in here after the train stopped? Not so far as I know. You didn't hear the shot? Well, I heard some kind of sound, but I couldn't swear it was a shot. Somebody hurt? Brady, my best operator, was shot and killed. The best of you to the coach just behind this door. You mean they killed a detective? You heard me. Did you catch the guy who did it? No, we didn't, but we will. You got a record of these bodies? Uh, yes. Mr. and Mrs. Lavelle checked through to Montreal. Do you have any idea what time it was when you thought you heard that shot? No, I didn't notice. Well, these seem to be okay. Let's go. Then I can leave it in your hands, Inspector, to check the possible suspects among the passengers. I've already given orders, Mr. Lennon, for a complete checkup on their backgrounds and destinations. I'll be able to furnish you with complete data inside of two days. Well, that's fine. Now, with your permission, Inspector, I'd like to be able to join the men you stationed at the railway terminal and check up on the passengers who came up with us, in case any of them are returning on tonight's train. Certainly. I'll give instructions to have the men completely at your disposal. Well, that's very kind of you. Now, as I told you before, I feel sure there was at least one accomplice on the train. You mean the one you call a professor? Yes. It may be just a chance, but I don't want to overlook the slightest possibility. I have a good man following him. We'll get his report later. Well, that's fine. I'll keep in touch with you during the day. I'm returning to New York tonight. Thank you, Inspector. Goodbye. This is the most difficult case we've ever had. Why did he have to pick on us twice in the same place? Two days of the most concentrated work I have ever put in. And at the end of it, what have we got? Just two clues. First, that both the diamond merchant and Jake Pringle got their reservations at the Ritz Plaza. And second, that a certain little drunk who calls himself Professor was on the train both times the robbery was committed. And that he lives at the end of East 12th Street. We're keeping a close watch on this, Professor, all the time. That's fine. What you need, young lady, is some sleep. But first, how about something to eat and drink? You know that little spaghetti place that stays open late? You're getting to be a mind reader. Look, there's nothing further we can do tonight, Captain. I guess not. Come on, Dr. Watson. Okay, Mr. Holmes. Good night. Come up again, eh? Mr. Len, what's the matter? You not come to see me two, three weeks. Giuseppe, if I told you what I've been doing for the past two or three weeks, you wouldn't believe it. I know. If I was a nice-looking fellow like you, I know what I do. Yeah. You sit right here. I'm gonna make it those ravioli for you. Huh? Ravioli like you never tasted before. Okay, Giuseppe, but leave the wine. Well, how's your appetite? Oh, not so good. What's the matter? Are you too tired? No. I know, darling. We've been working you too hard. Val. If my getting back those papers would have mean your life, I'd never forgive myself. Now, now, don't let it get you down. But, Val, it could so easily have been you on the other end of that coach instead of poor Brady. Look, honey, if you were to find those papers at home tomorrow in your handbag, I'd still have to go on. Don't forget there was a fortune lost in diamonds. Not to mention that it's my job to get the criminals who killed Brady. I know I can't stop you. I do realize that it's your work, but... Val, it frightens me. My dear Watson, 
Your case is strictly elemental. What you need is a little music. <laughs> Maybe you're right, Mr. Holmes, but I'm no musician. Neither am I, but I'll do my best. Now, you stand right there. Well, I didn't know you could play. Oh, you know how it is. All great detectives have to have some outlet. When the toil of the day is over And my brow is knotted with care I feel you smooth the frowns away, dear with your quiet hands in my hair. How do you like it? Oh, it's lovely. And when you put them in mine, dear, without words I understand, you are silently saying you love me with the touch of your quiet hands. Young lady, I have a very important question I want to ask you, and it concerns only us. Oh, uh, and if I refuse to answer, Mr. Lennon? How long have I known you, anyway? Oh, a couple of weeks, I guess. It seems as though I've known you all my life. Darling. Hey, Mr. Lennon, the radiologist is coming right up. Go to the house. Get the other room. Go into your act. Make it fast. Hello, Joe. Hello, Abel. It's not that it doesn't make me happy to have you call, but what's the idea? Well, it's just a further checkup, Abel. But don't take it personally. Oh, I'm not going to take anything personally. It seems to me you fellas are carrying this thing a little bit too far. In your statement, you said you didn't open the door of the baggage car when you heard that shot. For the third time, I didn't open the door of the baggage car, so what? Do you live here alone? No. My wife lives with me. Where is she? May? Yes, Abel? Come in here a minute. Did you want something, Abel? I want you to meet one of the boys, Mr. O'Neill. He works down the railroad with me, my wife. How, How do you do? do? He's a railroad policeman. Well, you see, Abel was on the train when both robberies occurred. And I was sent over here to check over your house. I got some crazy idea that maybe I saw the robber on the train, the phantom robber. Oh, it's only a matter of form, as you might say, lady. You see, I get my orders and I have to carry them out. Well, you haven't got anything to hide, have we, May? No, but I sort of hate to have a stranger. Uh... Oh, he isn't a stranger. He's supposed to be a friend. Well, it's all right, I guess. But I do hope you won't mess up my linen. No, I'll be careful. Well, why don't you come with me, Mrs. Krantz? Maybe I'd better. Men are pretty clumsy. I don't know what it's all about, Abel, but I didn't find nothing. I'm sorry, Mrs. Krantz, if I put you to any inconvenience. But you know I have to do my duty. That's what I've always told Abel. Duty is duty, even if it is unpleasant. Well, good night, Abel. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Krantz. Good night. You must come and see Abel again soon. <laughs> well, I got a hand it to you, kid. You are swell. 
You must come and see Abel again soon. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that settles Abel Kranz. Perhaps we exaggerated his importance by thinking he was the only one of the train crew that could have had anything to do with it. After all, you have to admit that studying to become a train dispatcher is a queer occupation for a crook. Yeah. The real accomplices will probably be found in the back of a big limousine studying racing forms. I suppose there's no way we could get a list of the names of the passengers. We have a list of all the passengers, but crooks don't give their real names. Well, then you know the names of everyone that was on the train both times? Everyone, except one, the crook who got away after the robbery. Well, then it would be possible to check and see if there was anyone on the train during both robberies. We have, but only one made the trip both ways. That was our old friend called the professor. Oh, by the way, uh, Montreal said that the professor delivered an envelope to a man there in the station who made a successful getaway. I can't get it out of my mind that he's mixed up in it somehow. But still, he's not the type for that sort of work. Maybe. But they wouldn't hire anyone very important to do what, after all, is only a messenger boy's job. But nevertheless, isn't it rather a strange coincidence that he should have been picked to make the trip on the same occasion as both robberies, and in the same car? Yeah, yeah. Well, look for your records and see where compartment E on the first trip and compartment D on the second trip were booked. That's right, I'll hold on. I just thought of another lead. I'm checking on it now. Hello? Yeah. Is that so? Both from the Ritz Plaza. Well, thank you. You've been a big help. Our first break. We know that the diamond merchant and the gambler both got their reservations at the Ritz Plaza. And I just found out the professor got his at the same place. Is that important? Important? I'll say it's important. Look, the gambler, the diamond merchant, and the professor all got their reservations at the Ritz Plaza. Now, that's more than a coincidence. They were on the same train and in the same car. Somebody in that hotel had knowledge of the trips those men were going to take. I'm going to talk to that professor again. Send a man over to pick up the professor and have him brought to Captain Harrigan's office right away. He'll be here in half an hour and we'll put him through the hoops. What are your means of support? As an humble member of our economic system in this machine age, I, like everyone else, work. You uh, thought I had an income? I ask you where you get the money to live. You see in me, sir, a professional traveler. Now, this is serious business, Professor. Please come to the point. Why did you travel? Where and for whom? Now you've placed your finger on it, sir. The fly in the ointment, as it were. I gladly proffer my destination and some slight reason for my trip. But for whom, I cannot tell you. All right, all right. Now, one thing at a time. Where did you go in Montreal? For a walk. I want to treat you as politely as possible. Now, you're mixed up in a serious affair. And if you don't drop that attitude of yours, I'm going to drop mine. I am being accurate, sir. I was hired to go to Montreal. I was instructed to remain in my compartment until the train arrived there. Then I was to deliver a letter to a gentleman I should meet at a designated spot. And did he show up? Definitely. I delivered the letter. And then my time was mine own until the train left for New York that night. And as I say, sir, I took a walk. And you don't know the name of the man you delivered the letters to? No. What was the name and address of the man who hired you? How many trips did you make to Montreal? Only two. And both those trips were made on a train which was robbed while you were on it. A coincidence, my dear sir. I give you my word, absolutely a coincidence. I know nothing whatever what occurred while I was on the train. How did you get the job? I was seated at the park bench taking the morning sun, which has been my want for some years, when I idly picked up a newspaper which some kind sold it left and scammed the want ads. Oh, not that I expected to find anything that would fit my peculiar talents, but I ran across this advertisement. Oh. What was the name of the man who hired you? That I was given fifty dollars not to tell. And we Van Bellens never break faith. Not when we're paid fifty dollars. All I can say is it was a richly furnished apartment in a poor neighborhood. My conversation with the gentleman was of the briefest. He merely handed me the ticket and the $50. How did you get in touch with him a second trip? After the completion of my first trip, I ventured to call on him offering my services further. He informed me he could offer me odd jobs at intervals. He 
took my telephone number and told me when to call to pick up the tickets the second time. Well, I don't know whether he's a lunatic or a liar, but at least he's consistent. Stick a man with him day and night until this mysterious employer of his calls again, then we'll take up the trail from there. Thus relieving me of any slur upon my honor, and I can accept the $50 with a clear conscience. It was given to me not to tell the name of my employer, and I shall not do so. But however, I cannot stop you from following me when I go there. I don't like this plan of yours, Val. It's dangerous business. Somebody. Yes, I know it's got to be done. But why not let Bain do it? Bain has a wife. Sure he has. And unless I miss my guess, you're going to have one yourself before very long. Why not give her a break? Look, I'm sure I've got this thing figured out. I'll stake my job on it. If anything goes wrong, I'll take the blame. Well, all I can say is good luck, Val. speaking. Yeah, a tall guy. Frenchman. Yeah, car one, compartment D. Yeah, 10,000. He's got it on him. Another three days of this, Professor, and I'm going to go crazy. I grant you this long confinement is a bit irksome. But, my dear fellow, think of the millions at this precise moment who are engaged in some arduous labor. Yeah, I guess so. Mr. Van Dollen. Telephone. Listen, Professor. I'm going to be right behind you. You know what to say. I always know what to say. Hello? Yes, this is Van Bellen. Oh, yes. Quite free. Very well. Where? 38 to 9th Avenue. Yes, I understand perfectly. Thank you so much. What do you say? He wants me to go again. Says he's moved. Wants me to pick up the ticket in an envelope at 38th and 9th Avenue. Some sort of store. Uh-huh. Captain Harrigan? Conway speaking. Yeah, contact has been made. No, he's picking him up at some store. Okay, Captain, I'll follow your instructions. I've already made arrangements with the Pullman conductor for whatever space you'll need to plant your men. Okay, thanks. Well, I'd better get on board. You know my compartment, D. Now, I'll wait there. You'll have your men planted. Then you can come along and we'll make final arrangements. That's right. There's no use in you being here. You might as well get back on the train, and then when he comes aboard, you can spot him. I'll see you later. Car 7. Car 9. Car 4. Car 1. Oh, I feel awfully nervous. You know, I feel a little tight inside myself. <laughs> you know, just like when you used to play football, just before the first kickoff. <laughs> Car 3. Car 6. Car 7. I haven't seen anyone that even resembles the man that robbed me. Do you suppose he could slip on board at the last moment? You know, I don't think this decoy business of Val's is going to work. I think he's fallen down this time. Well, don't forget we didn't see him last time in spite of watching everyone that went on board. Yet he was there. Well, that's right. I have to hand it to him. He's the phantom robber, all right. Well, there goes the last passenger. We better get aboard. Oh, just a moment, please. Uh, all right, Lubbock. You'll have to hurry if you want to make the train. It's everything, Abel. Everything's okay, Captain. Car number one. I want you to keep on the job tonight, Willie. No going to sleep, you know. No, Captain, no, sir. Are you sure everything's all set? Yes. I've been able to spot my men out of sight without anybody knowing. 
but they told me they hadn't seen anyone resembling the description of the man Miss Marshall gave them coming through the gates or getting aboard the train. No one's infallible. I'll stake my reputation on having figured this case out. I know the murderer's on this train. But why put your life at the mercy of a killer? Oh, Val, I want you to drop the whole thing. I don't want the papers at that price. Look, Mr. Gullard wants his diamonds. Jake Pringle wants his money, and I want that gang of crooks. Now, I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm in no more danger than you are. But why jeopardize your life for the sake of papers and diamonds? But it's beyond that now. That man killed a policeman. I'm certain that sometime tonight, he's coming in this compartment after this money. And make sure when he comes out, he doesn't see anyone. Wait until he's in the front vestibule before you come to release me. I think we should grab him when he starts in. Oh, yes, please, Val. Think what would happen to you if he got excited or alarmed. Now, don't you worry. I'm not going to resist him. Remember that. Well, we're going to be in this next compartment. And if we hear anything alarming, we're coming in here, plan or no plan. Come on, Miss Marshall. But you will be careful, Val. All aboard! All right, Willie, we're off. And uh, you stay right here, Max. Well, were you able to plant your men all right, Captain Harrigan? Yes, I have one in the berth on this car. Max is going to stay here, and I'm going to be in the compartment next to Mr. Lennon. Very good. Come on, Miss Marshall. Dear estimable railway detective, as much as I esteem your companionship, I hope it will be terminated very shortly. You better hope that it will be terminated happily. Curiosity has never been a failing of mine, and even now, I have no interest in the reason for your companionship. So here's to a quick trip and a quicker goodbye. Now no hashway, Professor. Do you hear anything? No. Now, Miss Marshall, don't be so nervous. Don't let this plan of valves upset you too much. Oh, Captain Harrigan, I can't stand this. I keep seeing that man creeping closer and closer to Val. And when I realize that he's a killer, a, a murderer, well, it's all I can do to keep from screaming. Listen, if I didn't have the utmost confidence in Val's ability to take care of himself, I never would have okayed this setup. I'll see that nothing happens to him. Now, relax. So many people walking around this time of night, all the days of my life. You give me the fidgets. Right off that cheap gin, you wouldn't be so nervous. No face don't help any. It's the last time I'm gonna ride in one of these. It's getting on my nerves, I tell you. If you can think of a smarter idea, just let me know. Yeah, well, you better pick up a new one. I ain't going to this stuff no more. Next time I ride in a coffin, I'm going to be dead.
Get him up. Keep your fingers crossed. He's just going into Val's compartment now. Monsieur, what do you mean? Button up your trap. Turn over on your back. Come on! emergency car's been pulled and the train's But stopped. why wait? But he escaped that way last time. He won't this time. Well, I've gone this far with your plan. I might as well go the rest of the way. I'll go back to the Pullman and get the other man. Right. We'll wait here. Let's go. Rack. Hurry up, Donald, before we lose him. No, we won't. We've got him trapped this time. Well, I'm going with you. Well, no, you promised to do as I ask. Now, I'll be back in no time. Come on, Harrigan, let's go. Open up, Kranz. No one can come in here. Open up, Kranz. You're under arrest. You haven't got a chance. Open up and we'll break it down. anymore. Now, where's the other one? Unless I miss my guess, he's in here. Give me a lift with that lid, Captain, and watch yourself. Well, that's the last of them. I'd like to extend my congratulations, Mr. Vale. She was pleased to hear about you and Miss Joan getting married. Thank you, Willie. Yes, sir, marriage is a fine thing. Ain't nothing like mad life. Oh, Willie. Yes, sir. Get the rest of our bags, will you? Yes, sir. Darling. Mr. Lennon, when you start capturing people, you sure do a good job. If you want to watch your stuff, Willie, you may be next. Yes, sir, but I'm on my good behavior now, boss. Ain't gonna be no phantoms on this trip with you alone. <laughs> good night, sir. Good night. Mr. Holmes, you can't put me off any longer. How did you know that man was in the coffin? You remember the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. LaBelle that were being shipped to Montreal the time Brady was killed? Of course. Only one reached his destination. Oh. Well, where did the professor come in? Well, we found that he was unwittingly escorting coffins, which the killer used as a means of getting off the train. My, my. Did I ever tell you what a clever man I married? Mm -hmm. And did he ever tell you the cleverest thing he ever did? Not yet. Tricking you into marrying him. <laughs> 